Good morning, good afternoon and good evening colleagues. Wherever in the world you are at this time and moment. I am Gagan, your moderator for the session today and a very warm greetings to all of you from UNICEF headquarters. We all are at a unique crossroad today. On one hand, we are into the action years of SDGs with time to press the accelerator. And on another hand, we are facing this huge pandemic of the magnitude that none of us in our generation saw ever before. This has the potential to reverse all the gains that we have achieved in the last two decades. And for the first time, we are actually as a global community facing the real risk of an increase in neonatal deaths in recent years. That if you have to achieve the SDGs, the focus has to be on newborn because many more countries are lagging behind the target of reducing neonatal deaths as compared to under five deaths. And many of them may not meet the SDG 3.2 until a century too late. And newborn and fetus have to be the part of the universal health coverage. And with more and more women delivering in the hospitals in the last few years, more and more newborn are accessible to us in our facilities. And this is a big opportunity for all of us. So 94 authors and six chapters. And today we will be focusing on the chapter two, what the numbers say. Next slide, please. And a large number of organizations, as you see, have been involved and large number of you working in the field who have actually worked, who have actually contributed, were the part of this. So this is something which was a true collaborative effort, both from the global community as well as the people from the field. So to take this, we have today, first and foremost, Professor Joy Lon. And I don't think Joy needs any introduction. She has inspired many of us into public health, including myself. I've been listening to her for several years, and she has been a great source of inspiration and champions for newborn. Thanks, Joy, for being there today. We have Professor Khalid Yunus from the American University of Beirut, and he would be speaking on a very important topic, congenital malformation, because this is the condition which has seen the least decline in the last 15 years in terms of the neonatal deaths, mortality cause. And as you are conquering the easy mortality, this is going to be an increasing share, which already it is. Then we have Professor Pablo Duran, the Regional Advisor in Perinatal Health at WHO's Latin American Center for Perinatology. And he will be touching upon another critical topic, retinopathy of prematurity. Because as more and more premature babies are being saved, and as more and more oxygen is being used, you have the whole gamut of ROP, which needs equal focus. And last but not the least, we have Dr. Ornella Linsetto, who has been a part of this report and who has been the face of newborn for WHO for several years. And I know Ornella since 2013 when I first met her in Vietnam. And thanks, Ornella, for whatever you are doing for the newborns of the world. And then Benedict will run us through the question and answers, and I will close the session then. Over to you, Joy. Thank you so much, Gagan, and thank you to WHO and to UNICEF for very important leadership at this critical juncture for the world. And also, as Gagan says, this moment when we need to pay special attention to the world's most vulnerable citizens, small and sick newborns. It's my privilege on behalf of many, there were 94 authors, I think, involved in this report. It's my privilege to take you through what the numbers say where we are now and what data do we have to inform us, including a, a special angle on, on the, what the pandemic may do in terms of affecting the course that we are on and need to be on going forward. So the report is called Survive, Thrive and Transforming Care for Every Small and Sick Newborn. And the data gives us information on survive, uh, really critical urgency and yet also opportunity. There are not many things in the world that kill so many and yet have a solution that is in our hands and that we could be implementing. Thrive, 
Often we think of death as preventable, but in fact, most disabilities are also preventable. We need to have a focus not just on survival, but on disability free survival. And we will be hearing later about a specific angle on that from Pablo on retinopathy. But this is really important for us to keep in our focus and one of the most effective investments in human capital over the life course. And then transform to inform our health systems. So two weeks from now, when we look at chapter three, we will be looking at what to do in health systems. But who needs care, where, and how can we move that forward? So as uh, Gagan has highlighted, this juncture was meant to be a year of focus on the sustainable development goals with 10 years to go, a sense of urgency. Still, the agenda from the Millennium Development Goals of Child Survival is with us, but for the first time in history, we have a target for newborn deaths. And that newborn death target is really at risk. But we also have an, a much wider and crucial agenda within the SDGs. Families desire not just that their babies make it to one month or one year or five years, but that they would grow up and survive and thrive. Linking with nutrition, linking with child development, and looking at universal health coverage, how does that work in practice, and also markers of inequality. And maybe one of the reasons why newborn deaths and also stillbirths have failed to come on the agenda is because they happen often to women without voices. So gender equality is critical uh, for the sake of women, but also for the sake of future generations. And to drive all these targets, we need the right data. And this talk today will be about the data we have and how we use that. But very importantly, four weeks from today, we will have a talk on uh, a later chapter in the report uh, led by Dr. Louise Day with many others, and I believe Gagan will be speaking in his own right on that, um, looking at how do we improve that data? How do we use it? And what can we do differently now to capture outcomes and also coverage of care better? So moving on to the key findings. First of all, survive, ending preventable newborn deaths. So each year, we have two and a half million newborns dying. This is a huge number and we can get lost in that number. And one of the beautiful things in the report is putting the face on parent stories of how this affects uh, the reality for people all around the world every single day. We also have 2.6 million stillbirths and this is from 28 weeks of pregnancy. So ICD says we should count from 22 weeks and compare internationally from 28 weeks. And this is a number that is also critical and yet still lost on the global agenda. The Every Newborn Action Plan, based on country consultations and, and a, a lot of voices from around the world, set a target for neonatal deaths, but also stillbirths. The neonatal target came into the SDGs, the first ever one for newborns, but stillbirths did not. And this uh, report is focusing on small and sick newborns, but stillbirths should not be lost. So as we look at this target, target 3.2 in the SDGs, ending preventable child and newborn deaths, the newborn deaths now account globally for around half of those deaths are moving slower. And that really needs attention and it is possible to change. And the exciting positive news is that at least 78 high burden countries have set targets since 2014. And more than 90 countries are implementing. And this is really a, a credit both to country leadership, but also to fantastic partnership between UNICEF and WHO and others. So that's the good news. And yet on the other hand, we have these 40 countries who need to at least double current rates of progress to meet the target. Really fundamental. So as we move forward into the data, which regions are those countries in who need to make most progress? So this chart shows the projected date that each region 
would reach that national target of 12. So the UN coloured blue line with the star is when uh, that target would be reached by each region. And we note that, for example, Latin America and, and some other regions have already met that target or would meet it before the time. And we want to underline the target is to end preventable newborn deaths. If your country is already below 12, it doesn't mean that you your job is done. Uh, preventable newborn deaths is more like a level of three. Uh, but the sustainable development target is really to reduce inequalities between and around the world, but also within countries. So if we look at countries within regions, for some countries, it may be 100 years before newborns have that same chance of survival. And for South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, where two thirds of newborn deaths occur, we definitely need much more leadership from governments and from partners uh, and uh, more accelerated action. So if we move from global to regional to country, what this map shows in orange is countries that are having the slowest rates of reduction for neonatal mortality rate. And in the orange colours, you can see that there are also some countries that actually already have lower rates, for example, North America, but slower progress. So the places that we need particular attention on are those with the highest rates and also slowest progress. And many of those are humanitarian settings. The counterfactual of that is that there are also fast progressors. So every region here has a fast progressor. Southern Asia, it's Bangladesh. Sub-Saharan Africa, it's Rwanda who have overtaken Malawi. And if we look at the global level, there are 10 fastest progressors globally, and all 10 of these have made substantial progress on investments in small and sick newborn care, including respiratory support for preterm. So to get to 12 and to meet this target, much more focus is needed on this small and sick newborn area. And yet, as noted by everybody at the beginning of this, this is a time when we're under unprecedented threat because of a global pandemic. And this very important paper that was published uh, just uh, a week or so ago in Lancet Global Health looks at what the effects could be from reduced coverage of care. So as well as the direct effects of uh, the SARS-CoV-2 infection and the COVID pandemic on families, there's also an indirect effect if people are not able to access healthcare services or workers are not there or uh, things are changed in service provision. And particularly for care at the time of birth and for care for uh, small, sick newborns and children, this is a huge threat. So even with 15% reduction in coverage of care for six months, we could have quarter of a million excess newborn and child deaths globally, robbing us of gains that have been hard won after the last 20 years. With a 45% reduction in care, and that's based on what happened in Sierra Leone during Ebola days, for six months, we could have a, a major increase in maternal deaths and also in newborn and child deaths. And it's particularly driven by care around the time of birth and inpatient services, but also wasting. So really important that as well as doing everything that we should do to address the pandemic, that we make sure that we protect essential services for the most vulnerable. And then if we move forward to uh, the data about when to focus. So your birthday, is your day of highest risk. Every year around the world, about a million newborns die on their birthday, their only day. The risk is steep in this time period, but also in the same point at the time of birth, around 1.3 million intrapartum stillbirths occur and a high proportion of the world's maternal deaths. So the bad news here is that this is the greatest risk of death and also of disability. The good news is that if we address quality of care, which is all about time, sense of urgency, 
and very sensitive marker of health system function that we can get a return on investment in terms of deaths for all these three outcomes, but also in terms of improved development and reduced disability. Mark Twain said, the two most important days in our lives, the day you're born, which is why we celebrate birthdays, the day you find out why. And I know many on this line, many colleagues working all over the world on this important issue. But if you've joined this webinar and you're looking for something to do, this is one of few issues in the world that is both a big problem, but also with great solutions that are doable. Two to focus on. Well, in global health data, really critical to look at boys or girls, the sex match, and we see this also in the COVID data. So baby boys have a biologically greater risk of death, but girls have an increased social risk in some cultures. So we need to keep our data looking at what these equity gaps are, but also use that data to drive change so that all are reached. And then if we look at who's most vulnerable, well, the small newborns is a big problem, both for death, but also for long-term outcomes. 80% of newborn deaths are in low birth weight babies, two thirds of whom are preterm and about a third are small for gestational age. And then which conditions? So over the last uh, 15 years since the Lancet neonatal series in 2005, we've talked about three main causes of newborn deaths, preterm, birth complications and infections. But the time has come to shift that to be five. We need to include congenital conditions and we look forward to hearing more about that later on this panel. And also neonatal jaundice, less deaths maybe, but an important cause of long-term morbidity and also extremely preventable and with solutions. Preterm birth is the largest cause, not just of neonatal deaths, but also child deaths uh, and affects families all over the world. Where to focus? So has Gagan highlighted <clears throat> at the beginning of this session, now 80% of the world's births are in hospitals, yet quality gaps and this network focuses on quality of care cause many preventable deaths for women and children, but particularly for newborns who are very vulnerable to quality of care. And so I want to move on to Thrive, ensuring health and well-being for every newborn. Importantly, we lose substantial human capital to newborn complications. Neonatal conditions account for about 7.5% of the total global burden of disease. This is about three times that for AIDS, similar to that for all cancers. And as well as that effect, <clears throat> which comes through deaths and disability, and it's mostly still through deaths, we have an under-recognized social, economic, and emotional burden on parents. And this report really throws a new light on that and how to address that. National economic development will be like swimming against the tide unless we address newborn health and also growth and development in that critical first thousand days. The effect of small babies is not just death, but it's an also thriving within childhood, but it's also long term. So, for example, in South Asia, where about half of the world's low birth weight babies are born, this is a major driver for the non communicable disease epidemic. And so far, virtually no country in the world has had major success in reducing low birth weight. We can and immediately in our hands have the things to do more for small babies, but we also need to pay more attention to prevention and to better measurement so that we can prevent better. So finally, <clears throat> and more briefly, moving on to transform. Each year, 30 million newborns need effective care. 140 million are born in the world, but they're not born equal. Your risk of death and disability depends which world you are born into, 
depends on the status of your mother and her family. And there are still 44 million births that happen at home. This report particularly focuses on the quality gap for those 45 million in facility births in lower middle income countries and the upper middle income 40 million. But in all these worlds, we need to do more for women and for vulnerable newborns. So taking that image of four worlds on one slide and putting it into a public health approach, 140 million births a year, all of them need immediate care for the baby and effective care for the woman. But 20 million will require at least special newborn care and eight to 10 million will it require more intensive care, at least a move towards respiratory support with CPAP. And this is really critical. We need to design systems that allow us to do this and to do it fast in every country of the world to close gaps. Otherwise, we face an ongoing loss of human capital. We cannot reduce these deaths. We cannot transform surviving, thriving without addressing this. And we also need to take into account this hidden parent burden. And this report includes powerful stories from families all over the world. This is one that's included in chapter two of a pediatric nurse from Hungary. Her experience and her voice and how she's used that afterwards. So I want to finish by saying that as well as transforming health systems, using data, getting better data, we also need to challenge social norms. It's no longer acceptable that newborns are born just to die. We need to count, we need to give certificates, but we also need to have societal recognition of these deaths. They can't happen in silence. Otherwise, that implies that they are just a norm. They cannot be a norm because these deaths are preventable. There's an urgency. This is a great return on investment. We need to do better to make that investment case. It is achievable. We have the things in our hands and we need to make sure we still do it. And we do have data for action. There's a lot more information in the report, many ways that you can engage. And this slide gives some other places you can get information. I'd like to really credit all the other uh, authors involved in this chapter, uh, the editors across the report, all the other authors, and also Stephanie Kong, who has done a beautiful job helping us with slides. And I now pass the baton to Professor Yunus, who will talk to us about the critical issue of congenital abnormalities. Thank you. Halid, you can start talking. We cannot hear you. Halid? It looks like his microphone's not working. Shall we? Move if we go to Pablo. Yeah, shall we move to Pablo and we try to fix Halid? Uh, Pablo, are you ready to go? Yes, yeah, sure. Let, let me share the. Yeah. Now you can share your screen, Pablo. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, colleagues, and thank you for your attention. Um, I'm continuing with this session. I will refer to retinopathy of prematurity as a leading cause of preventable blindness in Latin America and the Caribbean. And we all know uh, that retinopathy of maturity is a leading cause of potentially avoidable childhood blindness worldwide. Uh, based on this paper, sort of Blenko and, and 
also Professor Joy Long, in 2010, it was estimated that more than 180,000 preterm babies and ranging from 170 to more than 200,000 babies develop any stage of ROP and that more than 32,000 newborns are annually estimated to develop mild to moderate or severe visual impairment. So we know that uh, preterm babies are at a greater risk of visual impairment and that two thirds, around two thirds of them are born in middle income regions. And this is not different in Latin America and the Caribbean. And this is why we perform uh, a multi-country survey in 2015 in order to consolidate the available information from our region and mainly regarding uh, four main issues, uh, which are the, the national incidence of ROP and the availability of national level government inputs, such as the existing national policies, guidelines, programs, and financing mechanism for ROP, for the detection, treatment, and including uh, screening. And we found that around 10% of the uh, at-risk cases resulting in blindness or severe visual impairment uh, and most likely caused by the most acute disease stages and with the absence of uh, advanced treatment. Um, based on these four lines, uh, inputs that we assessed, the, the availability of national policies, guidelines, programs and financing mechanisms, we observed that only two countries had the old, the four inputs uh, reaching screening coverage greater than 90% of those eligible newborns. In the case of countries with three or four inputs, the screening coverage was 95%. And in contrast, in countries with one or two inputs, the screening coverage went down uh, in those eligible cases, and it was around 35% in average. So, based on this picture, uh, we, we identified that it was needed to provide and to define standard criteria to identify all eligible newborns in order to avoid missing potential cases, as well as to strengthen the, capa the capabilities uh, of health systems to provide follow-up care, to improve technology, and to develop and support skilled health professionals. Um, so, what what we have done? I'm sorry. Uh, we have developed a, a clinical guideline with the objectives of providing evidence for early diagnosis of uh, retinopathy of prematurity and prevention of risk factors, uh, and also strengthening diagnosis, treatment, and follow-up of newborns with retinopathy of prematurity. And you can see the link to the clinical practice guideline that we have developed. We are providing technical cooperation to countries based on this guideline in order to present the guideline and to promote its adoption or adaptation to the national realities. We promote surveillance, monitoring, and evaluation, and also inform education and communication strategies that I'm going to present in more detail. This guideline, and, and you can see here the poster that we developed in order to promote the addressing the recommendations, um, the, uh, the guideline and the activities developed have two main objectives. One is to improve prevention, especially safe oxygen use, and secondly, to promote and strengthen screening and early detection. The guideline and the information education and communication interventions are aimed at promoting and monitoring the adequate use of oxygen, adequate provision of oxygen in terms of temperature, humidity, and concentration. And the guideline also promotes screening prior to discharge 
from the NICUs according to the gestational age of the newborn and promoting monitoring based on, on risk conditions of the, of the newborn. And also, however, as it is not enough to have a guide, we have established a, a regional technical advisory group that, to promote establishing national advisory groups um, in, in all the region. And we have also developed tools for monitoring quality of care, both at institutional and individual level. You can see here the, the tool that we call assessment of essential conditions, which is an online instrument that allows to assess the quality of health services from a structural, functional, and resource availability perspective. And these tools, and you can see the link, um, in, in, in this tool, retinopathy of prematurity has been considered as a marker of quality of care at the time of designing the tool. We have also developed, based on the prenatal information system, a clinical record form and an information system that allows uh, the registration and analysis of information regarding risk, interventions, and results related to ROP at the individual level, at the newborn level. We are also working on the definition of a basic minimum set of data for the registry and monitoring of ophthalmological care. We are working atlas on retinopathy of prematurity, and we are at the final stage of developing an online training course that will be based on the virtual campus from the Pan American Health Organization in order to promote uh, addressing the, the content of the guideline and to promote the implementation in the in the health facilities. Um, so thank you very much, and I don't know who will continue with the first. So I'll, I'll leave the floor. It's, thank you very much, um, Dr. Duran. I'm now giving the floor to Professor Yunis, who is back on the call, and he will talk about um, the use of data to address congenital condition in the LAC region. I'm passing the floor, I'm giving the floor to you, Professor Yunis. Yeah. There we go, you can share your screen now. Can you share your screen? Can you see it? No. Do you have the share button? I'm... Do you see the share button on the on your? Yeah, on I the see the, I see the share button. Oh, now it is. Okay. Okay. Well, yes. just make it full screen and then oh, yeah, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you for your patience. All uh, today, I'll be talking about congenital abnormalities in the Eastern Mediterranean region, and I'll be using the term birth defects interchangeably. Sustainable developmental goal, as Joy Long said, the 3.2 calls for reduction of neonatal mortality under five by 2030 to less than 25 per thousand live births. Congenital abnormalities account or constitute three to 6% of newborn globally and account for 2.6 million deaths in the neonatal period. Therefore, they are a leading cause of mortality under five, as well as morbidity and lifelong disability. 15 of the 20 countries with the highest estimates of birth defects prevalence were in the Eastern Mediterranean region, according to the March of Dimes Foundation Global Report on birth defects that was published in 2006. Consanguineous marriages, which is pretty high in the EMR, are a major risk factor and may account for this elevated uh, uh, high prevalence. The, the EMRO, the Regional Office of WHO and the EMR, commissioned a situational analysis of congenital abnormalities in the EMR 
to be carried by the National Collaborative Perinatal Neonatal Network, NCPNN, based at the American University of Beirut. The situation analysis was carried in two phases. The first was a comprehensive literature review, and the second was a country situation assessment questionnaire developed by the network and disseminated by the World Health Organization, EMRO, to the 22 countries in the EMR, of whom 19 responded. The data or information that were collected consistent about information about existing programs on surveillance, methodology used, whether direct, indirect uh, data collection, national, subnational data, the types of congenital abnormal abnormalities uh, covered, whether stillbirth or termination of pregnancy were, were involved or included, the age at which collection of data occurred at birth only, or it, at any time, uh, the, were the personnel taking the data? How were they trained and who were they? Newborn screening programs, did they exist? Were there any prevention or preventive intervention program in place? And finally, what were the barriers to establishing a surveillance program? This slide depicts the results of the situational analysis. Striking that 55% of the countries, 55% in the EMR, had no congenital surveillance program. 12 countries. Only four countries had an, or 18% had a national surveillance program that collected information on all congenital abnormalities. And 27% or six countries had limited surveillance. What were the barriers? We divided them into three. Gaps in the health information system, such as weak reporting resulting in under-reporting, or poor data on, or on stillbirth and abortions, incomplete health management information system, HMIS, linking of data, poor linking of databases together, and the absence of dedicated congenital abnormalities registry. Then you have the resources, human resources, the lack of human resources, such as trained medical and administrative personnel that are trained to identify and diagnose and to collect maternal and infant data, a poor or absent infrastructure for surveillance and finance, which is very important to be able to carry your surveillance. And finally, conflict situation, which already currently we have Syria, Yemen, Libya, and Iraq, they are in conflict situation, and this will result in the system, limiting the healthcare system ability and shifting of priorities. So the key messages of the situational analysis were, was that half or more than half of the EMR lacks congenital abnormalities, and it's essential to develop surveillance program to assess, to assess the true burden of congenital abnormalities and their contribution to mortality, morbidity, and lifelong disability. And the SDG 3.2 cannot be achieved without targeting congenital abnormalities. WHO EMRO needs to provide surveillance experts and consultants to assist countries in developing and strengthening the surveillance system. And it's very important if the capacity of a certain country or countries in the region is limited to learn from the experience of other regions where they have developed regional networks such as Eurocat in Europe, ECLMAC in South America, and in the Southeast Asia, they have their own network. And it's very important that we do the same in the EMR. Finally, it's important to develop strategies that are needed for prevention, for care, 
and finally for implementation. Prevention by developing programs such as folic acid fortification program for prevention of neural tube defects, vaccination programs, awareness on consanguineous marriages and their consequences, public health measures directed at the prevention of genetic diseases, and providing services such as genetic services, providing care and educational services and programs, and implementation of surveillance programs. I'm going to stop here and pass the baton now to uh, Dr. Ornella. Yes, Ornella, you can unmute yourself. Thank you. Good afternoon to everybody. Good morning, good afternoon. So I'm in the last few minutes, I will uh, share with you a few slides on the COVID in pregnant women and newborns, basically the latest data. What you can see here is uh, the link to the website of WHO where you can find the resources on COVID for pregnant women, uh, newborn uh, and children. And um, down. So in pregnant women, in general, the, so far there are, not so, uh, there are limited data on uh, the clinical presentation and also on the perinatal outcomes after COVID-19 in pregnancy and in uh, newborns. So, but based on the current available data here, there are a few points. So for COVID in pregnant women, uh, what we know so far is that there are no different, apparently there is no difference between the clinical manifestation of COVID-19 in pregnant women and non-pregnant women of reproductive age. So this is uh, one point. And the second is that uh, it doesn't look like, I mean, if the woman is a COVID positive and pregnant uh, doesn't seem to have uh, uh, higher risk of severe disease compared to the general population of all non-pregnant women. So, um, which is a, which in one side, from one side is a good news, and but of course, uh, uh, if the woman has a pre some kind of uh, NCV or conditions like hypertension, diabetes, of course, like any other COVID positive patient, it will have a higher risk of severe disease. And then regarding uh, um, uh, other outcomes, there is quite a, a lot of uncertainty and the moment on possible uh, increase uh, risk of negative maternal. On your, uh, this because data are especially limited to the infection in the third trimester, given the, uh, the, the new fact that the pandemic is relatively new. And there are and um, and there are, however, some cases of pre labor rupture of uh, membranes, fetal distress, and preterm birth reported, but not uh, so many to uh, justify uh, at the moment to say that we have an uh, increased risk. So, to better establish the, uh, the situation uh, of uh, uh, pregnant women, a number of court studies have been uh, started in uh, many countries. And uh, WHO, in collaboration with the uh, network of countries, following up on these uh, uh, outcomes. Regarding the newborns, also we, uh, of course, the data on newborn are more or less uh, uh, very much related to the ones we have on the pregnancy. So we have uh, so far very few cases uh, uh, reported of newborns with the confirmed uh, COVID. But and all uh, in these few cases, a whole had uh, mild. Uh, conditions or even no symptoms at all that could be attributable to COVID-19. So this is a very good news. And uh, to date also, the live virus has not been found uh, in samples of amniotic fluid, cord blood, vaginal discharge, neonatal throat swabs, or breast milk. And this is also a bit good news because, uh, um, you know, uh, the recommendation that we had uh, on the care of uh, essential care of babies uh, can remain the same fundamentally. 
Then, uh, but what we know, uh, there have been a few reports, uh, a small number of babies with a positive serology of PCR at birth, but it's not clear how they, they got contaminated. It doesn't look like it's a result of a vertical transmission so far. Amniotic fluid that remains, as I said in the code, uh, negative. Uh, and uh, in, all, in those uh, women where uh, it has been tested, there were women who had cesarean section. And finally, uh, on the sample, uh, so far, all uh, samples of breast milk have been tested negative by PCR, except that we heard about uh, an unpublished report. Uh, we heard about, about the two mothers with the breast milk samples positive for viral particles by PS, uh, PSR, but uh, we are waiting for uh, reports on the viral culture. So hopefully. We hope it's negative. And uh, we also don't have published reports uh, to date of babies uh, who got, uh, uh, who develop uh, uh, COVID-19, uh, uh, babies of asymptomatic mothers who develop uh, COVID-19. So basically the situation of newborns is quite uh, positive and this uh, justified the WHO recommendation on uh, uh, no separation of uh, babies uh, uh, of mothers who are COVID positive uh, uh, immediately after birth or in the postnatal period and allowing breastfeeding uh, as with actually promoting breastfeeding as with uh, any other uh, woman, as well as allowing kangaroo mother care in uh, case the baby is uh, preterm, of course, with IPC precautions. Thank you very much. And uh, I hand over to Bene, who will uh, assist us with uh, uh, the um, uh, with the question and answers. Thank you, Onella. We have question that came for Pablo, mostly uh, for Pablo Duran. The first one is a question from Kat Kirk, thanking you for the example of LAC and how to scale up detection and management of RLP. She said that a major barrier in Africa in is access to screening equipment, skilled ophthalmologists to detect and limited treatment options. So has telemedicine been explored in that country for remote hospital? And is this something that could be uh, replicated elsewhere? You are probably on mute. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the question. And, and yes, it's really important because Providing the access in, in, in many countries and, and, and most of our regions is a key issue. This is why we are working and we are trying to put it uh, available on the website, not only the, the, um, the atlas that I mentioned and the training course, but also developing some telemedicine um, um, developments in order to facilitate the access to the diagnosis through different media, uh, sharing pictures, so training the human resources at the local level to take pictures and share with, uh, with the experts in order to, to provide support. So this is important to, to develop in, in, in most regions, maybe in Africa and, and, and in Latin America also. Okay. Thank you. Another question for you. Um, from Caroline McLennan asking whether the use of humidification for low flow oxygen is as conflicting evidence and CPAP. And she would like to comment your comments on that. Uh, yes, the, the, the lack of uh, equipment uh, and resources at the health facilities, it's really an issue and, and we work hard on, on promoting the health facilities to, um, to provide the, the easiest way of um, so, um, respiratory support. And this is why CPAP, we, are, we promote CPAP as the a, as a best way of, of providing uh, ventilatory support but still uh, there's a need for strengthening the availability of resources in terms of blenders, uh, humidif humidifiers, and, and the, the other stuff that is required, equipment that is required to provide the best, uh, the best care. Thank you. Another question from Nina Katka. 
um, who is asking for more information around health system. How was the ROP guidance integrated into existing newborn care protocol and guidance? And does it emphasize the importance of a holistic approach that includes time identification of encephalopathy story, infection prevention and management and feeding care? Oh, yes, this is also a, a key question. Uh, we are moving on integrating these specific recommendations on retinopathy of prematurity to the whole perspective clinical guidelines for newborn care. Uh, and also, as I've shown in the presentation, including in the information system at the individual level and the newborn level, and also assessing as a as, a, as an indicator of quality of care from the institutional level. So, from our perspective, including ROP is uh, essential to be included in the, in the whole quality of care approach uh, at the different levels. Thank you, um, Dr. Professor Duran. I have two questions for Onela. The first one from Nina Katka as well. Have there been any studies on antibody levels in amniotic fluids and new goods of COVID affected mothers? Can, can you repeat there was some noise here? Uh, is there been any study on? Any studies on antibody levels in amniotic fluid and newborns of COVID affected mothers? To my knowledge, not yet. Um... So, but in the breast milk, yes, but no, 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 not yet. So we don't know. Yeah. Okay. And another question from Judith by code also for Nella, um, saying, thank you for sharing the good news on newborn and COVID-19. Do you know if this information is changing practice in country such as China, where they are enforce, enforcing two weeks separation of COVID positive mothers and their newborns? In China specifically, I don't know, but we are we are doing our best to influence changes in countries. Um, so we have published the question of an, uh, an answer for healthcare providers as well as uh, for uh, um, for uh, mothers and families uh, in our website. We are uh, next week also publishing the new guidelines uh, on clinical care, where there is an expanded uh, chapter on the care of um, women in the postpartum and the newborns and the breastfeeding. So we hope that with this uh, guidance, we uh, people will feel uh, more reassured in, uh, in uh, doing what we recommend, basically. Thank you. Thank you. A question for Joy from Laura Paul, um, asking for, for those of, of us working at community levels to prevent, pre, to prevent preterm births, what focus of research would you see as most helpful to move the discussion forward on potentially effective prevention interventions? Yeah, this is a really important question. I think a lot of the prevention research comes from high income country and more biomedical, you know, pessaries or srodka sutures. Uh, so in low income countries, uh, particularly looking at uh, preventing early pregnancy, uh, looking at infections, uh, so malaria, often the studies for malaria and pregnancy fail to measure gestational age. So an important message both in programs and in research is we need to accurately weigh babies and do better on gestational age uh, because otherwise we confuse our measurements and confuse our solutions and innovations. Um, and then the you know that there is definitely more scope for prevention for example there are interesting studies about uh, working in the fields and temperature you know heavy workload for women there are a lot of things that are now ongoing uh, but i think we need to really take the message from this report that whilst working towards preventing uh, the thing that we have in our hands now is we could reduce probably by three quarters the deaths for preterm and small babies now. We really have in our hands the things to do for that. So we need to do both. We need to act now and we also need to find ways to innovate and to prevent. 
Thank you. I wanted to go back to a, a follow up comment um, about the, the study or lack of study um, in amniotic fluid from Pranesha Appal Sami, who said that there is a recent, fr recent French study in preprint that showed a positive PCR test for amniotic fluid suggesting transplacental transmission. What are your thoughts on this? Onela. <laughs> Maybe on mute. Yeah, can you uh, can you uh, repeat the question, please? Yes. So uh, Pranisha Abalsami mentioned a recent French study that showed a positive PCR test for amniotic fluid, which suggests trans transplacental transmission. What do you think of that? No, I think that we have all, so far we have only reports and we don't have enough uh, evidence to to suggest that we actually have the vertical transmission so i think it's more uh, we need to be patient to collect the data um, you know from cohorts from cohort of women who are uh, followed up uh, during the pregnancy and then see if uh, these are confirmed so these uh, reports are confirmed you know, on a few you PCR, uh, uh, I mean, we can also have uh, false positive, false negative uh, contamination during uh, uh, different phases on the uh, on the childbirth process. So we we, uh, we don't have yet uh, all the elements to say that we have the the vertical transmission from this virus. Thank you. Now we have two questions. Even if, uh, even if uh, you know, there are two reports. I mean, there is one report uh, I heard where there was an infection in uh, the, I mean, presence of the virus in the placenta, you know, so it actually infected the placenta. And also even in the sperm of, um, you know, but uh, there are other elements that are telling us that it's not passing through uh, to the baby. Thanks. I have a two final question very quickly for Professor Yunis. Uh, one from Rebecca Rhodes asking whether you could give a bit more detail regarding the public health prevention strategies, aside from consanguineous marriage and wellness, and what seems to be effective? Well, uh, besides the consanguinity, as I, I mentioned, also uh, building uh, programs around genetic uh, counseling, uh, bringing also uh, folic acid fortification uh, and also uh, so these are the things that we need to do uh, for prevention vaccination such as rubella vaccination needs to be put in place to prevent the rubella syndrome uh, so all this needs to be put in place Thank you very much. A last question for you, and then we will close down. I will hand over to Dr. Uh, Gupta. Another question for a last question for Melissa Pedisu for you, uh, Professor Yunis. It would be helpful to have an idea of how low and middle income countries stand globally with respect to the incidence of congenital abnormalities. How low and middle income countries? The low middle income countries stand globally. You mean, I didn't get the question. Well, in, in terms of, of data, uh, how are uh, the incidents or the, the how are LMIC? Yeah. yeah. The rest uh, of the world. Well, uh, again, if uh, the, 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 I think the March of Dimes uh, global reports have very nice uh, figures on uh, the entire uh, estimates. Uh, they derive their estimates uh, based on the best available data and and they have uh, they had uh, they have a very uh, very nice estimates from the highest to the lowest uh, estimate and the, unfortunately the low middle income countries uh, lie in the in the highest estimates in terms of uh, birth defects. Yeah. Thank you very much. This is, this... Sorry. That's what Sorry, it. I, I, I'm referring them to to this. Uh, uh, to the March of Dimes Global Report. Okay, thank you very much, Prof Professor Yunis, and to everybody on the call. I'm now uh, handing over to Professor Gupta to close the session.
Thanks, Benedict, and thanks to all the speakers for the wonderful presentation and to all of you to take out time to listen to it amidst all the busy schedule currently. Just to sum up, the need, the urgency and commitment is higher than ever before. We heard about the need and the urgency. Let me tell a bit about the commitment. With COVID, a lot of investment is going on in the inpatient care and on oxygen therapy. And both these things should act as a catalyst to also stimulate the care for newborns and the small and sick newborns in the health facilities and the laboratory support and the data systems and the human resources. To use this initial spurt, which is happening in all the countries around facility strengthening and leverage it to the advantage of all the newborns who would benefit in the years to come. And I would like to also thank that Bob and Shiv from our team who are there and who are part of this organization of this webinar series. And to my colleague Nabila, who is not here anymore with us, but who was the one person who was pulling this all together along with Lily Kark. So thank you to all of you. And please join the next webinar series on 3rd June. Best is register now before you forget. And thank you so much once again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.